Hello everyone. Today we're going to move on to another type of circuit and it's the introduction to lecture 5. Switch capacitor circuits. So the goal of today is try to understand why we need this type of uh, switch capacitor circuits and introduce them. We are using something called discrete time and I'm going to introduce some of the principles and get you thinking and also touch on the type of circuits that we need inside these uh, switch cap circuit. But let's start with the why. And for the why we have to roll back a bit. So we know we can create filters, active RC filters. And what we're looking at that screen now is An active RC, it is a second order filter. It is what is usually referred to as a biquad or a biquadratic. That's basically just because there's two quadratic equations. No special meaning there. But what we can notice is that the pole and zero frequency of this active RC filter is proportional to some sort of conductance divided by capacitance, which is the same thing as one over RC. Now imagine that we make an integrated circuit version of this biquad, of the biquad, the active RC biquad. That will mean that our resistors and capacitors will not be the same. So in integrated circuits, we make a mask, or actually we make about 40 masks, and then we copy. And so every single circuit that we copy of the 100 million or a billion circuits, they are supposed to be equal, but they will not be. We cannot make identical circuits. We're not at that, that level of precision yet. So the resistor will vary and the capacitor will vary. So that means in the end, if we assume about 20% variation for each one of them, the pole and zero frequencies will vary about 30% or 28% to be exact if we assume that both of these vary with a normal distribution and uncorrelated and blah, blah, blah. Now, if we want an accurate pole or zero frequency on our filter, that's a bit of a problem because we might end up trimming. And what I mean by trimming is we can't really change the circuits that are on the chip because the 100 million chips are identical. But we can put in circuits to change our resistors, for example. You put multiple in parallel or multiple in series, and by doing that, we can have switches and we can sort of tune our resistor. And that's something we usually have to do if we want an accurate polar zero frequency for active RC filters. And the same applies to GMC filters. Now in the GMC filter, we make the conductance with a transconductor and we use capacitors. So now the pole and zero frequency is proportional to GM, the transconductance, divided by capacitance. In GMC filters, the variation might actually be maybe more, depends on how good you can make the transconductor, but you'll still get that 10, 20% variation, three sigma, for the capacitor. And we can fix that with calibration and tuning. But calibration and tuning will always add cost because every single one of those 100 million chips are supposed to be identical. So we can't add circuits or we can't remove circuits unless you do laser trimming of your resistors for every single chip, which is how you end up with some integrated circuits costing, I don't know, hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars. So what's the alternative? Is there something we can do with a circuit that gives us an accurate pole and zero frequency and an accurate gain, for example? And turns out there is. Way back when, I don't remember when this paper was written or the period of switch cap was started, 
but it turned out that you can actually replace resistors with a switch or a couple of switches and a capacitor. And we'll try today to introduce how this works. But the main point is, in the circuit that you're looking at right now, and let me zoom in a bit, we have two capacitors here at the input, and we have two capacitors in the feedback network. The way this works is that in the first phase, phase is the input signal to the switches, we sample the input differential voltage onto these two capacitors. And we can see that the bottom plate of the capacitors is connected to ground. And then we turn phi1 off. And if we do this correctly, then when we turn phi2 on, we do it in such a way that the charge on these capacitors is the same before and after. So when we're at the end of phi1, and when we're at the beginning of phi2, so when phi2 turns on, the charge is the same. Now you can see based on the circuit that the op amp in here will force its inputs to be the same if it's designed correctly. And we can see that we short the other side, the left side of the capacitor, to be the same voltage, which means there cannot be a differential voltage across these two capacitors. That's just, it can't be. They must have the same charge at the end, so there's no differential. But we know that charge is conserved. If you put a difference in electrons across a capacitor, a difference in charge, then they cannot disappear if we ensure that we start at the end of phi one or at the end of phi one and the start of phi two the charge is conserved or we haven't lost any electrons while we're switching the switches, then those electrons must go somewhere. That charge must still be in the circuit somewhere. And as soon as we make this correctly, they will actually end up across the feedback network capacitors. Since the input capacitors is four times larger than the feedback, in this circuit we end up at the end of phi2 with a gain or with a voltage at the output that is pretty much exactly the same as four times the input differential voltage. Now, when I say exactly, of course it won't be to infinite precision, but it will be really, really good because now our pro, or actually in this case, our gain is proportional to a relationship between capacitors and that we can make extremely precise on integrated circuits. And for this gain, it doesn't really matter if the C1 and C2 are 80 femtofarads or 100 femtofarads. It matters for noise, but not for the gain. So, as you saw now, there is actually a fundamental difference between active RC, GMC, which are continuous time filters, and discrete time switch capacitors filters. The output is only correct at certain points in time. Kind of like digital circuits, but not exactly, because in discrete time circuits, we still have continuous value. So the value on the output can be anything between zero and ground. Zero and ground, zero and VDD. Now, here we get into a bit of the mouths. If you look in the book, Johnson Martin and Caruso, you will see there, over the years, there have been mathematic mathematicians looking at this or circuit people looking at this and trying to come up with a way of defining sampled signals that tell us some information of how they behave in the time domain and the frequency domain. Because in fact, mathematics, mathematics is actually one of the few areas within science that we can prove something is true. Most of the time in applied physics and, and my field, electronics, we sort of stuck with not proving things through true, but we can prove hypothesis false. But in mathematics, you can actually prove that something is true. Now, you might not understand it, and that's fine, but it's important to, to understand the, com the um, consequences. So let's define 
the xc variable here as a continuous time continuous value signal and log and then we imagine a function this is a step function so at time e uh, less than zero it is zero at time larger than zero it is one and then we combine two of those such that combined this l of time minus some sort of period so the multiple multiplum of a period n times t minus the same thing but just a small delta so we get sort of a step or it's almost like a direct pulse but not really it's an approximation of a direct and we normalize it to make sure we get the same area under the curve then if we say in that the continuous time actually we define the <laughs> our continuous time variable as the same as the infinite sum of these sample periods we can actually think of a sampled version continuous in value but discrete in time as an infinite sum of these pulse trains so why would it do this well it turns out it's good for the mass so when we go to the frequency domain with this definition then we can do the Laplace transform and we can get an expression where we have we can actually take a limit so when the um, tau here approaches zero we end up with expression where we have our original signal and we multiply it by a shift in frequency and this s here is just well in the Fourier transform is just j uh, omega in this case is discrete so it turns out when you go from a continuous time or a continuous time continuous value signal to a discrete time continuous value signal you end up copying the spectrum with a multiplum of the sampling period now the maths here is not the important part you can sit down you can work through it and you can spend a few years trying to understand it and try to figure out how they got to this conclusion if you're a math person fantastic if you're like me that look at sometimes look at equations and you go uh, I'll skip this part then what is important is the consequences and then that is the fact that when you sample a signal you get copies of the input spectrum at every uh, integer multiple of the sample period we can actually do this we can actually emulate this in Python so you have a link here and you'll find this, that in the lecture notes where you can run this in Python and you will see a plot uh, let me just go through this so we create a time vector and let me go full screen we create a time vector which is an emulation of continuous time this is not continuous time because it runs on a digital computer so it's not continuous in time but we can can make it an approximation of a continuous time signal by just increasing the number of samples first we have the t which is our time variable and then we create an input signal now this input signal is just a sum of sinusoids with slightly different frequencies and some random noise and now we need to sample that signal our continuous time signal so we create an array with just one one zero zero which I believe will turn the sampling frequency into one fourth of our time resolution that might be a half but I, I think it's one fourth and then we just combine a series multiple of or a number of these and now to sample we can just multiply them together and then we convert into the frequency domain now here I use a few tricks for first of all I use a window because when you do a fast Fourier transform it is important that the start of your of your time domain signal your start of your time domain signal is exactly the same or it doesn't create a discontinuity if you take copies of that analog signals and put them together because if you have a discontinuity you would actually get energy spreading and you will see sort of a shape that folds out 
So I'm just using that as a trick because I know that's a good idea. So we multiply the window by the input to force the value at the ends to be the same. We do a false Fourier transform, and then we do a frequency shift, so we get plus and minus frequency, and then we plot it. And you will actually see that the, if I'm able to switch the slides, there we go, oh, too far. Let's try again. You will actually see that our original signal is the main sinusoid plus the two we added, and there's some noise. Now, if you haven't seen a complex FFT before, you might think, wait a minute, there's two, actually there's four, uh, six sinusoids here. We just put two in. But then you have to go to Euler, and you have to go to the definition, uh, definition of a sinusoid. And you will see that a sinusoid is actually equivalent to a positive something also uh, something oscillating with a positive frequency and something oscillating with a negative frequency and the whole thing divided by two. So any real signal is actually two complex signals. So I haven't put in the frequency axis here, but it starts at around 4,000 and everything below that is negative frequency and everything above that is positive frequency. But what can, the important thing is that we can see in this plot when I multiply with a sampling vector, so 1100, zero, zero, I get a copy of the spectrums. So this will happen. But you can't see an infinite series here because our time resolution is finite. So we can't see all the way to an infinite frequency. But we can just approximate that and we can go further and so on. But it shows the main point. When you sample an analog signal going from continuous time, continuous value, to continuous value, discrete time, you get copies of the input spectrum. That also means if you have any frequency content in your input, so this is modeling as sample and hold, imagine we have that, the input here would be some sort of continuous time, continuous value signal, and we sample it and we hold it and we set it out in the output. If you have high frequency noise, imagine you put your phone next to your ADC. Your phone transmits at gigahertz and quite high power, maybe a watt, so there will be frequency content above your sampling frequency. And if you're not careful, those will actually fold down into the green part here in my wonderfully drawn graph. And you get, maybe you get information that you don't want. Which is why when we transition from continuous time to discrete time, we have to limit our bandwidth of interest. We can do that with a low pass filter. So we take this yellow low pass filter and place it around our, the green band of interest. And in this case, our sampling frequency is here. And then we filter these uh, high components and we end up with an approximation of, or actually a discrete time version of the green part without all the harmonics or noise or spurs or any uh, frequency component higher up. Now we don't have to put in a low pass filter, we can actually do also a band pass filter to select the higher bands. So we can select the frequency component we're interested in in the continuous, continuous time domain and filter the rest. Now this is an effect called subsampling. So the frequency of interest, the red part here, is actually above our sampling frequency. So this is also entirely possible in an ADC. You can actually sample above the, the uh, sampling frequency. But the important part is that if you want to be able to reconstruct the information perfectly, then you have to limit the bandwidth of this, the, this uh, band of interest, the yellow part, to the sampling frequency divided by two, which is the Nyquist theorem. Okay, when we're working in discrete time, it takes a while to write the expression that we got up, got got to with the n's and the t's and all that stuff, and engineers are fabulous for simplifying. So we just change the notation 
And instead of having e to the minus s n times the period, we just write z minus n. And you can look at the Wikipedia to, to understand the z transform. It is not very tricky. Now our translation from the continuous time value at a certain sample becomes quite trivial. So it's a good idea at this point to have a bit of a refresher, what pole zero plots are and what the Laplace transform and the Fourier transform actually tell us. So in the Laplace transform, it is the complex vector that is the, uh, let's call it the time response and the frequency response in the frequency domain, sorry. So I would encourage you to watch this video. I believe that it's the one from uh, blue, no, three blue, one brown, which is a guy that's really good at explaining uh, these things. But a funny thing happens when we go from the complex frequency domain to Z domain. And that is since our input spectrum now is repeated every two pi, the Z plane that we call it, this discrete time plane, it turns into a unit circle. So every sampling frequency, we, we rotate around the unit circle. It might go one way. Let's see. The, if we rotate with the clock, it is a positive frequency. Is it, If it rotates against the clock, then it's a negative frequency. And we can convert between the S domain and the Z domain with what's called a bilinear transform. But this is an approximation. It is a simplification. So have a look at where that doesn't apply. Usually it's okay if the discrete time information is less than about 10 times the sampling frequency. Then the bilinear transform will be roughly okay. Now that we have discrete time representation of circuits, we can actually create filters. So if Imagine that I have my sample. I have the sample at, well, actually the next sample. If I just combine the two previous samples, that becomes an equation. So take the previous sample, multiply it by a constant, and take the output that I have now and multiply that by constant. And if I work through the equations, I will discover I get a transfer function, which is the B divided by the Z minus A. And this is actually what's called an infinite impulse response filter. It never ends. The, the current sample will affect all future samples. And the cool thing about this is that you can actually very easily uh, figure out whether it's unstable or not by looking at the sum. Does it converge to a constant? Or does it become larger than one, kind of? Or does the sum of all those impulses become larger than one? Because then if it's larger than one, then it's unstable. And if it's uh, less than one, then it's stable. You can also create finite impulse response filters. And then you don't have a feedback from the output, the Y, back into the sum. You can just take your input, you delay it by one sample. so. Imagine I'm going to compute y here. Take my current sample and add the previous sample and add the previous previous sample together. Then I actually get a low pass filter, a finite impulse response low pass filter. So that means when we transfer into the discrete time domain, we can create filters. And you don't have to do this. You don't have to do discrete time filters with digital. You can do them with capacitors and still have continuous value, which is used in something called n-path filters, which is quite popular uh, these days in uh, receivers, and you can do a lot of fun stuff. But topic for the day is switch capacitor, because there we use discrete time. And what I want you to try and figure out, based on what I've said so far, is how do they actually work? Have a look at this slide and try to figure out what is the charge of 
C1 during the first phase and what's the charge of C2 during the first phase. And here I've just said the uh, V1 is L. And then you should be able to work out the rest. So left side is first phase, second side is the second phase, no sorry, so the, the right side is the second phase. And you have to assume that the sum of Q1 and Q2 are the same both on the left side and the right side. Because if you don't do that, then our switch capacitor circuit doesn't work right. So, principles. That turns out what you can make when you work out these equations is kind of cool. You can create gain. Because if I take the input, sa input voltage sampled across uh, the C1 capacitor in a first phase, marked 1 here, so 1 means the switch is closed. And in the first phase, the uh, C2 is shorted, so there's no charge across it. And in the second phase, I connect the capacitor to the uh, ground, sort of. And that means I transfer, or I use the op amp to force these two, the plus and the minus input, to be the same. And that will transfer the charge from C1 to C2. And if I look at the output as a function of the input, the input will stay the same. And if C1 is equal to C2, then the output will be zero for a certain time when my f when my uh, second phase is off and when my second phase is on, it will settle according to the speed of the up amp. And at the end of phi 2, the output will be the same as the input. It of course means that any processing that happens after the switch capacitor circuit, it can only look at the value of the output for a very small finite time. But that's okay. If you use an ADC, uh, which is discrete time, it just needs to sample the input voltage at a certain interval, and we don't care about what the input voltage is the rest of the time. Now, if we don't reset C2, so if we don't null the charge on C2, and we just keep adding, we will actually, g oh, actually, this first, this is just equations. So it just shows you the transfer function and the fact that the gain is... C1 divided by C2, and let's check that that is correct. So if C1 is large, then the charge on C1 is large, which means that if C2 is smaller, then the voltage will be higher. And that makes sense, yes, it's correct. So when it comes to not zeroing C2, we can make an integrator because we add the input voltage every time we sample. And once you have an integrator, you can make filters. Okay, same thing here. We can work through the time domain, discrete time domain uh, equations. We can very simply transform into the frequency domain or the Z domain. I should say Z domain by, okay, we have the output voltage and we have the previous output voltage plus the previous input voltage. By replacing this n minus one by z minus one, which is sort of the previous sample, I can simply write out the equation here and get the transfer function directly. Now, if I wanted the S domain equivalent of this circuit, I would actually have to put in the um, translation between S and Z, S and Z, uh, using the bilinear transform. And that's usually how we can synthesize filters also. We can do, uh, in the S domain, we know our polar and zeros, for example, from the bicord earlier, and we can put in the bilinear transform and we can get an approximate transfer function for the Z domain for the same thing. An important point is, although we're using we don't really have resistors in the switch cap circuits, so discrete resistors. We do still have resistance, and the resistors will have a noise given by a 4 KTR. Yeah, that's correct. 
Now, when you compute the noise in switch cap circuits, both of these phases, both the first phase and the second phase will add noise, and you end up with a noise variance or a noise power that is larger than two times kt, so that k is the Boltzmann's constant, divided by c, which is quite often why whenever we talk about noise in ADCs or noise in switch cap circuits, we talk about kt over c noise. So capacitors inherently don't have noise, but they store noise. So uh, I would say that working through the exact sort of calculation of noise in a complicated switch cap circuit is a bit of a challenge, but that's not the point. You know it's going to be proportional to kt over c. So you want lower noise, make the c bigger. And yeah, you can work out from this how much does you can work out from this equation how much does the C increase for every adding one bit to your ADC. Think about that. I have a slide in here, which is purely because I would expect quite a lot of you have forgotten how statistics or variance, mean square, and all these definitions, what they actually are. So let's just run through them quickly. The mean is the average value of a signal. You take any given signal, you integrate it from minus something to plus something, and you figure out what the mean value is. This is the, this, the continuous time version of mean. You can do also do it in sample domain. If you add, if your value is 2, 2, 2, 2, always 2, your mean value is going to be 2. If it's something else, your mean value is going to drift a bit. The mean square is, okay, let's square the value before we sum them. Now the variance, so how much these little, this signal varies, is defined as the mean square minus the mean, so then take the mean first square. If you take away, or if you have a signal where the mean is zero, so it always swings around zero, then the variance is equal to the mean square. Now, what happens when we add two of these uh, independent vectors? So let's assume we have a sinusoid and another sinusoid, or let's actually assume, assume two random vectors. If you sum them, we actually get a variance that is sort of a second order equation. And it sort of makes sense, right? We have the one x1, which is the first signal squared, plus the second signal squared, plus two times the product of them. If you remember when we talk about noise, we quite often just say, Oh, you just sum the variances. And that is true. Because if what we call the cross correlation or the covariance between x1 and x2 is zero, then of course we just have the sum of the variance. But if we actually have correlated noise, let's say some of the noise comes from ground and ends up on x1 and x2 and they actually correlate, then we can't forget about this, uh, the uh, loss factor here, which is the sort of the covariance. But if the covariance is zero, yes, then noise sums and as the sum of the variances. Now, the standard deviation or the sigma, that is just the square root of the variance. So that's why we always talk about sort of square root of the uh, sum of the variances. That's our standard deviation for the voltage quick recap of the mathematics of um, randomness. But the th point about are the vectors that you put in really random, that's important. Because if they're not, you don't get the sum of the variances, you actually have to have the co add the covariance also. I want to touch on also what type of circuits that you need in switch cap circuits. And one of the most important 
blocks is going to be the operational transconductance amplifier because that sets the accuracy, the sort of inherent accuracy of how equal can we force the inputs, those virtual grounds to be the same and how fast can we do it. So the op-amp is important. Here I want you to think and pause a bit and write down a list of all the op-amp names or OTA names you can think of. And then I want you in the lecture to ask the question, what is, let's take something simple that you all should know. What is a two-stage miller? And I can draw it, and if we had time, maybe we can go through all of the different op-amps that you know, and maybe you find something, find know an op-amp that I don't know what is, which is great because then I can learn something new, which is always fun. I put in an example. This is a differential op-amp. That means that both of the outputs, the negative and positive outputs, they swing opposite directions. Let's find the video camera like that. And I also put in something that we don't really have in the book necessarily, or it's not easy to find, but it's what's called a common mode feedback. Because when we have two high gain outputs that go like this, what prevents them to drift down or drift up? And that's the common mode feedback that keeps the center value at the right place. Now you can put this into your simulator and you will probably get a good starting point, something that might work. I also put in a simple bias to how to get the bias for the PMOS and actually different PMOSs and the cascode voltages and so on. We need switches. Now you would imagine that here I just have a transistor, but I don't. Uh, switches and switch cap is not trivial. First of all, you might have a problem with the charge in the inversion layer. Because when you turn the switch off, that inversion charge will sort of be pushed to either side and that can change the assumption or the fact that charge is conserved between the first phase and the second phase. And maybe they have nonlinear performance. Maybe the, the resistance of the switch is, is changing based on the input voltage. So although you can have a PMOS, let's see, this is NMOS, and you have a PMOS as your switch, sometimes you need both to be able to have a good, a good swing, which is called a transmission gate. That's the same thing. And sometimes you need to change the bulk voltage of those. And sometimes you actually have to do bootstrapping. And then you might have to go crazy and do bootstrapping with sort of dummy transistors and so on. We also need non-overlapping clocks. So we need our two phases to be non-overlapping. They need to be high at different times. And for that, we have a simple logic circuit and you can put this in, simulate it, and it'll work relatively fine. So let's do an example. What's the gain of the circuit. I want you to work, try and work that out. And you can we can ask questions and so on in the lecture. That's it for the day. See you later. I would encourage you to uh, read in the book these chapters. Thanks.